Olaf has to be one of the most inconsistent champions in the history of League. Almost every assumption one would have of him is actually the opposite. He's had one of the most volatile histories throughout League for his trademark playstyle, having incredible peaks but equally disappointing valleys. And though his play rate isn't exactly as non-existent as the likes of Bjork or Skarner, the reason I wanted to include him in Why No One Plays is due to how unpredictable he is as a champion, despite having one of the most simplistic designs and gameplays among the roster, perhaps even more lacking in nuance than the overwhelming majority of stat checkers in this game. Olaf's a champion you see every now and again, but never feel like you see him as consistently as other champions. Even if he's presently strong or weak, you'll run into games where he feels unstoppable, literally, and in the same patch, he'll find matches where basically anyone can do a better job than him. So for this episode of Why No One Plays, we'll be talking about Olaf the Berserker. When I mentioned the word inconsistent, I wasn't exactly referring to his abilities. He's actually one of the more consistent champions in that department. What's inconsistent about him are the circumstances revolving around him. For one, when you think of a stat checker like Mundo, Nasus, or Garen, you'd expect them to have a significantly higher presence and win rate in low elo due to both being easy to play and the average lack of players' experience in how to fight them. Conversely, in high elo, where players are more aware of how to play against or around them, they're not quite as popular. Olaf is actually the opposite. He has a comparatively lower pick rate and win rate in low elo, while each metric is better in high elo. That inconsistency is going to be the running theme with Olaf, and the main reason why it's hard for him to find any meaningful play. Looking at his popularity history though, you can see there were several months in time where he was exceptionally popular. But a lot of that had to do with once again extraneous circumstances, not so much his own gameplay. That was actually the driving force behind his misscope update in mid-2022. Contrary to what his skip may suggest, Olaf behaves completely differently from other stat checkers. More than any other champions, stat checkers are designed to be the most stable archetype in the game. They're either consistently strong, consistently weak, or consistently average. Compared to higher skill expression champions like Riven or Kiana, whose players are significantly worse at the champion in low elo than high elo, there's only so much a stat checker is able to do. And so the performance fluctuation from one rank to another hinges more on one's decision making rather than execution. With their black and white beat you or lose to you nature though, stat checkers are naturally regarded as hard counters in certain matchups, and if there's one champion who fits the definition of a hard counter, it would be Olaf, courtesy of Ragnarok, one of the most broken ultimates in the entire game, at least in theory. Those of you who have been watching me for a while may know that I detest abilities that break the rules of the game in an advantageous way since it renders them immune to conventional forms of counterplay. Trindamir's ultimate, for instance, is complete horse on account of invalidating the single universal counterplay against any champion to kill them. But the reason I don't have the same animosity for Kindred's ultimate is because it affects everyone, therefore not affording a guaranteed advantage for either team. Theoretically, Ragnarok fits that same criteria, as it allows Olaf to bypass all forms of crowd control in the game. Aside from death, crowd control is the best way to stop a champion from doing anything as it limits or outright prevents them from taking action, so giving a champion total immunity to hard CC sounds like a recipe for disaster in terms of bounce. It both is and isn't. Prior to his miscope update, Ragnarok lasted a fixed duration, 6 seconds to be exact. This meant for 6 seconds you couldn't do anything to slow or immobilize him. Because of this, Olaf was one of the best champions at beelining to a single person and beating the crap out of them, especially in conjunction with the massive amount of attack speed he gave himself. So unlike other counter champions whose abilities made them excel at fighting a certain class, Olaf's counter ability made him excel at ignoring a certain class, almost like a nerfed version of Old Poppy's diplomatic immunity. Olaf's invulnerability to crowd control and his stat check nature made him a very easy champion to grade in strength. He was either too good at his job or not good enough at it. If he could successfully reach the enemy backline and kill them without any possibility for recourse, he was too strong. Vice versa, if it felt like he couldn't do much even with his ultimate, he was too weak. Sadly for him, it would more often than not have to be the latter. Unlike other counter champions whose abilities directly inhibit the person they're intended to deal with, Ragnarok does the opposite. It was designed to inhibit the champions around the person Olaf was trying to kill. In almost every situation, Olaf's job is to charge straight for the enemy backline and take them down or die trying. He can do this thanks to any attempts at peeling him off them being useless, but his opponent, usually a mage or marksman, is still able to unload all the damage they want on him and by extension everyone else can do the same. Alternatively, instead of trying to lower Olaf's pressure, they can raise his targets, such as making them tankier with shields and heals or finding other ways to stall for time like Zanyos. And that's where we arrive at the first reason why Olaf, despite having a seemingly ridiculous kit, feels kind of underwhelming to play. He doesn't have the right set of tools to actually take advantage of his counter ability. Olaf's ultimate, back when it was 6 seconds and couldn't be extended, was not intended to be used against frontline enemies. It was intended to be used against backline ones where he could realistically kill them in that amount of time. Technically, Olaf's ultimate is effective against the likes of Nautilus, Orin, or Scion as the main pressure tools being their crowd control don't work against him, but being tanks, he's gonna need more than 6 seconds to break through them. The problem is that even though Olaf's ultimate is intended to shut down squishy champions, the rest of his kit, both old and current, are intended to shut down frontline champions like bruisers and tanks. 
Berserker Rage grants him increased attack speed and lifesteal based on how low his HP is. This works well against any champion who takes a long time to deal their damage as he can sustain faster than they can kill, such as tanks who can deal a fair bit of damage too but usually over a much longer period of time. Against a high DPS burst champion such as full damage ADCs or mages, Olaf can't really make use of his passives since they have enough firepower to finish him off before he can lifesteal it back. And with no easy way to get on top of them immediately, he'll take a lot of damage just walking in range of them. Reckless Swing is also the same thing, it's point and click true damage. Though this does work on everyone being true damage and all, it's best against tanks and bruisers for two reasons. One, he gets more practical value out of his E since it bypasses more armor per use against a Leona instead of an Ezreal. And two, Reckless Swing's cooldown decreases by one second per auto attack, and Olaf can attack frontline champs a lot longer than backline champs. Finally, both versions of his W, Vicious Strikes and Tough It Out are better suited against frontline enemies, not backline. Vicious Strikes gave him bonus attack speed, lifesteal, and increased healing from all sources based on how low his HP was, designed to complement Olaf's increased pressure the weaker he became through his passive. Once more against a champion with high damage, Olaf may not survive long enough to get the full value out of W as they could burst him before he could lifesteal. Same applies to his new W, Tough It Out, also gaining bonus attack speed, but rather than lifesteal and increased healing, he would gain a shield that was better at low HP. Though this version is indeed good for surviving burst damage, it's kind of a small shield during the early game. Jarvan's Golden Aegis gives a better shield than this. Granted, they did move the lifesteal component to his passive, so giving both sustain and a high value shield would be excessive. Pragmatically, the only ability that actually assists Olaf in getting to the enemy backline is Undertow, a long range projectile that damages and slows all enemies that he can spam by picking up the axe that drops on the ground, allowing him to repeatedly chase enemies that run away. In a vacuum, Undertow is a fantastic ability. It's damage, wave clear, poke, chase, and kiting, and it has a reset mechanic built into it. But it's kind of an underwhelming one in the hands of Olaf because that's all he has at his disposal to chase down opponents. Then again, that's assuming he even lands it, and the farther the opponent is from him, the harder it is to land. Basically, the main reason why Olaf doesn't get played nearly as much as other hard counter champs like Malphite, Nessus, Jax, Garen, and such is because his basic abilities and ultimate have split priorities, making it really hard for the balance team to find a decent spot for him to be in. Let's use Malphite as a comparison. Malphite is the ultimate counter to any auto attack physical damage based champion, being a notorious middle finger against a sizable number of top laners. And with how many physical damage dealers there are in this game, especially if we include AD carries down in bot lane, Malphite is guaranteed to mitigate the pressure of at least one person on the enemy team. The difference between him and Olaf is that Malphite is fully committed to shutting down a certain archetype. First, he scales off armor and gets a crap ton of it. Armor counters physical damage, what does virtually every basic attack that isn't from Mordekaiser, Corgi, and Kale deal physical damage. In addition, Ground Slam cuts the attack speed of all enemies struck in half at rank 5. So not only are you dealing paltry damage to Malphite thanks to its armor, but also your rate of fire just got slashed in half, making you even more useless against him. Lastly, with Unstoppable Force, he can get right in on your face immediately, then use Seismic Shard to prevent you from running away, forcing you to have to deal with him whether you like it or not. That's why Malphite is so effective at countering champions, he's 100% dedicated to beating physical damage auto attackers. This of course has the caveat of getting destroyed by ability based magic damage, but Malphite's designed to be a counter pick and does his job extremely well, and that's due in part to him having agency against the champions he's intended to counter. Olaf doesn't have that same agency. Like Malphite, Olaf was also intended to be used against a certain archetype, only he's kind of committed to two different archetypes. His passive Q, W, and E suggests that he excels at fighting low DPS, low mobility champions who can't exactly run away from his barrage of Qs, and they also don't have the strength to cut through his lifesteal. But his ult ultimate suggests he doesn't want to fight for too long since it had only a fixed duration of 6 seconds, barely enough time for him to kill one squishy target. This also makes itemization a problem for him. For Malphite, it's very simple, build armor since you get the most value out of it. For Trindamir, it's very simple, build full damage. Who cares about armor and magic assist, you can't die. For Olaf, you're sort of forced to itemize half damage, half tank. On one hand, you need enough DPS to actually pose a threat to whoever you're fighting, but on the other, you need enough survivability to not get one-shotted on your way to the person you're trying to kill. You're starting to understand what I mean by Olaf being very inconsistent, right? Now, the reason he had major spikes in popularity in the past is because those were time periods where he had the best of both worlds. With how much free sh** he gets, from attack speed to lifesteal to more attack speed to armor to magic resist to bonus AD, most players would just build full tank on him and rely on his space stats to get the job done. Depending on the time period, he would both be insanely tanky and deal insane amounts of damage. If you go through his balance history, you'll notice the overwhelming majority of his buffs and nerfs affect the free stuff he gets. With how universal of a counter ability Ragnarok is, it's highly likely for him to spiral out of control, and he has multiple times. Malphite and Trindamir are better at countering certain types of champions, but are kept in check by their weakness to other types. Olaf, on the other hand, can become too strong against too many champions, which is often why he has to stay weak so as not to have his cake and eat it too. That's why his base pick rate is so low, but his peak pick rate is so high. That and you know, he's very dependent on the current meta. 
Anyways, it's clear that Olaf needs to commit to something. Is he a tank buster or a backline diver? Ultimately, they settle with the former, changing his ultimate to be less effective against backline by reducing its base duration, but significantly amplifying its effectiveness against frontline by making it last indefinitely so long as he's attacking and or using reckless swing. To further push him in that direction, they made his lifesteal part of his passive so it can also last longer in drawn out fights versus tanks and bruises. Additionally, they gave him armor shred on Undertow. Olaf is now a huge counter against tanks or champions that heavily depend on crowd control, so one would expect him to be played more consistently especially if the enemy team has a tank top, tank jungle, tank support, etc, right? Yes and no. While his misscope did successfully point him in a specific direction and while it was the healthier direction to take, it was also the wrong one. His ultimate is designed to completely invalidate crowd control which is a tank's greatest weapon. But tanks exert pressure through short traits, not full-blown fights. Olaf's an all-in champion. No sane individual will attempt a full committal assault against an Olaf as a tank. Furthermore, he's kind of a lousy tank buster compared to the likes of Darius, Garen, Mordecai, Sephiora and such, as they have ways to force their pressure onto their opponent. Olaf kind of doesn't. Sure he has Q to slow them down, but that's about it. The only time he can pressure them is if they're stupid enough to let him attack them for an extended period of time. That's the key word, extended. Olaf is a tank buster, yes, but what makes him lousy is that it takes a while for him to do so. Tank busters are effective at fighting tanks, but they're also effective at fighting them fast. Olaf has true damage and armor shred, but he still has to hack away at them for a good while. At the same time, Viora can shred 80% of the health bar with her ultimate, Vayne can machine gun them down quickly, Garen insta-kills them at half HP, and Darius can get 5 stacks on a tank then flash W all to squishy out of nowhere. Comparatively, Olaf has to focus on one person, kill them, then move on to another, kill them, then move on to another. It's a very dragged out process. That's how you see most Olaf players go after the squishy enemy backline even after his mid scope. But now, he's even more vulnerable to being shut down, as all it takes is a Zanya's Hourglass or any stall tactic to run the clock on a short duration ultimate. Olaf's current moveset is best suited for playing front to back, but he himself struggles to play front to back because he takes too long to play front to back since Ragnarok doesn't counter tanks, it only lets them ignore them. All the same, they couldn't rework Olaf to be a backline diver since he's completely immune to crown control. So he's stuck in a weird limbo where his front to back tank busting is not as effective as others who excel in that field, which forces him to charge headfirst at a squishy target and try to kill them before his ult expires. But they can't let him get away with too much because there's no inherent counterplay against a champion who cannot be CC'd or debuffed. If hypothetically, Olaf kept his ultimate but took Trinomir's Q, W, and E, he'd be even dumber than Trinomir. At the very least, you can permastun Trin during his ultimate. Against Olaf, you can't. All in all, he's a juggernaut who has to play like a diver because he sucks at being a juggernaut. Don't get me wrong, he's still extremely good against tanks and practically sh** on every tank top laner in the game as well as some other annoying top lane bullies like Gnar, Gangplank, and Chase, but it's so easy for all his pressure to go down the toilet based on circumstance that he's not consistent enough to be played. The funny thing is, even though Briar doesn't have CC immunity, she does a better job depicting that Berserker experience than Olaf. Like, Briar does a better job doing Olaf things than Olaf himself. Maybe that's just because she has dashes and hard CC while Olaf doesn't. Anyways, that wraps up everything I want to say. Let me know your thoughts on Olaf in the comments down below, whether you agree or disagree with my points. Aside from that, if you enjoyed the video, I encourage you to leave a like and subscribe. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter at Varsfam, join my Discord server, and check out my other Why No One Place episodes if you haven't yet. But till next time, thanks so much for watching, and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Take care.